Thank you very much. You may be seated even as we clap for our team. Thank you. So may I take this uh, first opportunity, as I have said, to warmly welcome you to this policy lecture by the EU Commissioner on a very pertinent topic of climate action today at the University of Nairobi here in the beautiful Chiromo campus in the Millennium Hall uh, at the University of Nairobi. So the EU Commissioner, okay, I will not try to say the second name uh, because if I was to tell you that uh, my name is Professor Jesang Hutchinson, the Deputy Vice Chancellor uh, in charge of Research, Innovation and Enterprise at the University of Nairobi, the African names would be quite difficult, but we want to warmly, warmly welcome you to the university. Uh, together with your team, your delegation from the EU and also from the embassies here in Kenya, I want to recognize the presence of our Vice Chancellor, Professor Kiama, who will also be speaking to us shortly. Um, I want to recognize management of the University of Nairobi, all the directors, the Dean, uh, Faculty of Science and Technology, Professor Kerubo, Leonida, thank you for hosting us today, uh, and all the other deans who might be here today. Uh, staff members who are here, our students, we are so, so grateful that you are able to come, and I know that there could be some who are also following us online. So all of you, we want to extend a very warm welcome to you uh, because we feel that this topic is very critical for us as a university, but also as a country. Uh, climate change has become a global phenomenon. I don't want to belabor the challenges that we are facing globally, but I think our speaker may speak to some of them. And uh, just to highlight the fact that the EU actually is not just an ordinary partner for the University of Nairobi, we see the EU as a strategic partner uh, in our academic affairs, but also in our research. And the commissioner, just to say that currently we have about 14 active grants that are ongoing with the EU uh, that are actually covering quite a number of topics that are important to the country and also to the region. But on the 8th of June this year, the vice chancellor and the rectors, the vice chancellors from the African Research Universities Alliance, where the University of Nairobi is the only research intensive university that is there, was partnering with the Guild, the research intensive universities in Europe, under the Guild, to set up 20 clusters of research excellence. And so our partnership with the EU goes a long way, but we are so happy today to host you here at the University of Nairobi as you give your lecture. Allow me at this juncture to invite the Vice Chancellor to come to the podium together with our chief guest, the EU Commissioner, uh, so that then the Vice Chancellor can give the warm welcome on behalf of the university, give us his remarks, and then invite the EU Commissioner for the conversation that we are going to have today. But just to encourage you, this is not business as usual. These are very, very unique lecture, and so, Going forward, we hope that we can take something home to implement, especially on the policy framework, policy front, uh, but also at the university that we continue to do what we do best, quality university education and training, and also research, innovation, and enterprise. So I want to invite the vice chancellor to come together with the guest. You, there's a seat out there for you. Uh, can you give them a welcome as they walk up? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So while I'm a professor of horticulture, Professor Kiyama is a professor of veterinary medicine. Welcome to the podium, Pana Vice Chancellor. Then, uh, good morning, everyone. Yes, I'm happy to be here this morning. Um, 
joined by our chief guests who will be speaking to us uh, briefly. Uh, that is uh, Woke Hoekstra, the European Union Commission in charge of climate action. We have other guests here who would like to acknowledge Demiana Stoinova from the EU Commission, Jory Ospa also from the EU Commission, Alien Dempster from the EU Commission, Adre Simek, the Regional Deputy Head of Department, as well as uh, Deputy Vice Chancellor in charge of uh, Research, Innovation and Enterprise, Professor Hutchinson, or to acknowledge also the Dean of the Faculty, uh, Professor Enida Kirubo, uh, Brana Uma here, I see um, Olibi, and all members of management uh, who are here with us. It is an honor for me, on behalf of the university, to welcome you for this lecture. And also to welcome you, our guests, EU Commission, for coming to give us this lecture. It is really a demonstration of the excellent relations between us, as Professor Hutchinson has just mentioned, the European Commission, as well as the universities in Europe and the University of Nairobi. The university has continued to play a leading role in climate policy and the action. And we continue to support the country and the rest of Africa in this regard. And your coming here will only enrich us and empower us even to continue doing even much more work. As you may be aware, Africa is responsible for uh, about 4% of the global carbon emission. So we haven't done much contribution on the carbon emission, but we suffer the most. Yeah. We are bearing the brunt of the climate emergency with the temperatures rising at double average global rate. Climate change is already a deadly peril to Kenya and the region and you, you, need not, you need only look at its terrible impact on the Horn of Africa to appreciate what lies ahead without a concerted effort to adopt. We must adopt. We have no other option. And that is why the adoption agenda is African agenda. To demonstrate our commitment in addressing climate change, the University of Nairobi established two centers of excellence in research on environment. That is the renewed Institute of Climate Change and Adaptation, which is hosted in this faculty of science and technology uh, in Chiromo campus, and the Wagari Mada Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies at Upper Kabete campus. These institutes serve as global centers for research in this critical field and are open to work in partnership with the European Union and the other governments to promote collaborative efforts on climate change adaptation. As I mentioned earlier when we met, the, European, the University of Nairobi is the co-founder of the African Adaptation Acceleration Program, the AAAP in short. The CEO of the Global Center on Adaptation, Professor Patrick Fakoyen, is the distinguished chair of the Wangari Mada Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies. And he is all the way from Netherlands to come and work with us here. We are contributing through our analysis to build the vital pipeline of adaptation investment that make Africa resilient and also create jobs. With the University of Groningen, we are developing a master's program on adaptation governance. We are very proud of our impact here in Africa and in Europe. And my wish is that our partnership with you will bring the prosperity and the security 
that Africa deserves and from which Europe will also benefit. Ladies and gentlemen, it is now my distinguished honor to introduce the speaker this morning. Mr. Woke Hoke Hoekstra. He is currently the European Commission in charge of climate action. He served in the commercial positions at Shell from 2002-2004. He joined McKinsey and the company in 2006 and became a partner uh, from 2013 to 2017. He has also served as a deputy prime minister in Netherlands as, for, as well as uh, the foreign minister and also a minister for finance and also leader of the Christian Democratic, uh, that is the, the CDA party. Yeah. So he is uh, a known uh, gentleman here and in Netherlands and globally. Yeah. So that's the person you are going to hear from this morning. Yeah. The, this audience, sir, is eager to hear from you and uh, to hear your plans on how you intend to strengthen the European Union climate commitments, and particularly as regards to how you are going to work with the rest of us and Africa in general. With this, I want to request you to start as we receive our speaker. Please. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much. No, 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 take your time, take your time. Just, can we put it a bit back? Because it's for you. Okay, this Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice Chancellor, for your exceptionally warm welcome and for the, for the great welcome here at the university in your very, very kind words uh, to me. And, and ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear faculty and of course dear students, it is fantastic to see you and I'm honored and privileged to be with you here uh, today at your beautiful university. It is my first time in Nairobi as a European Commissioner for Climate Action, but it is my second visit to Kenya this year. Uh, back in June, as uh, Foreign Minister for, of the Netherlands, I already had the pleasure of visiting your beautiful country, uh, visiting your president and also many others of your government leaders. And I have to say that I'm really glad to be back so soon after my previous trip, uh, and also because that is another opportunity to strengthen uh, the, the bonds between your country and the European Union. And I'm saying that because Kenya is a key partner for Europe and for the European Union. Frankly speaking, in many aspects, we have a very strong bilateral relationship and we will soon expand it when we sign, when we sign our economic partnership agreement. And you are making amazing progress in your green and digital transitions, inspiring many across the globe. And the European Union is very much looking forward to working alongside you, with you in partnership, uh, in friendship, to make these transitions a huge success. But this is far from all of it. In its most recent history, uh, Kenya has developed itself into a truly crucial player for regional stability, regional security, and, of course, prosperity. And in addition to this, I see the European Union and Kenya thinking quite alike in many multilateral issues, including on how we should tackle uh, climate change, which has been the main reason for my visit today. Dear friends, allow me to be honest. The geopolitical situation the world is facing, we're all facing, is extremely challenging. 
Russia's horrible invasion of Ukraine has consequences far beyond European soil. Democracy and the rule of law are unfortunately under threat in every corner of the world. We see rising tensions in the Indo-Pacific and the latest developments in the Middle East are creating new divisions across the region and the world with uncertain consequences. And of course, and you know this much better than I do, on the African continent itself, in the Sahel and in the Horn, we're witnessing fragile regimes challenged and sometimes overthrown by military coups and non-state armed groups. And still, and still this do does not diminish the absolute urgency, the absolute necessity to tackle climate change. Climate change is actually compounding these security challenges. It is becoming, if you will, more and more geopolitical. Populations that are affected by wars and instability also face droughts. They face floods and they face natural disasters. Climate change is therefore a truly global crisis. It affects all of us. All of us in all corners of the world. And because of that, I feel it transcends political divisions and diverging interests. We can only solve this when we work together. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, as a politician, I'm hardwired to think in terms of interests, which may well be conflicting and require that we make difficult choices. I deeply believe, I deeply believe that the best outcomes for society are found when we work together with as many partners and parties as possible. Bridge building, finding compromises. It is second nature, it should be second nature to all of us. But when it comes to climate change, there is another guiding principle. There should be another guiding principle. And that principle, and I'm sure that is honored at this university, at this great university, that principle is science. To tackle climate change, we have to make sure we're guided by science, we're guided by facts. And as you will also know, the science is crystal clear. To keep one and a half degrees within reach, global greenhouse gas emissions must peak, and I say it again, must peak by 2025 at the latest, and that is two years from now. And science is also very clear about the next steps. By 2030, global greenhouse gas emissions must be reduced by 43% less than the 2019 levels. And then by 2035, we need to reach 60%. And finally, by 2050, we need to have reached net zero CO2 emissions, along with deep reductions in other greenhouse gas emissions. And those are not just numbers. They're not just abstract things. This is the only way we, as a global community, will be able to make a 1.5 degrees future a reality. And dear friends, in four weeks, the world will gather, will gather once again, and this time for COP28 in Dubai. The latest scientific evidence shows that current pledges and current targets made by countries are not nearly enough to limit global temperature increase to 1.5 or well below 2 degrees. And that situation is deeply, deeply, deeply worrying. Our modeling shows that current global policies are leading us towards a temperature, temperature increase of three degrees. And unfortunately, Africa would be the continent that is most affected if we let this happen. And already in this region alone, the impact of drought in the Horn of Africa and Kenya has been devastating. So to tackle climate change, in order to tackle climate change, we have to succeed to do many things at the same time, even though that is very difficult. Above all, we need to drastically cut in greenhouse gas emissions from all emitters, and especially all major emitters. The 20 countries in the G20 together are responsible 
for 80% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And as the Vice Chancellor said, if you actually look at Africa, the number is very, very small. And what we also need to do is we need to marry this with support for communities to, to adapt and prepare for the consequences of climate change, in, including through disaster risk reduction measures and through funding for the loss and damage that can be uh, incurred as a result. And if we make, if we make enough progress on mitigation, the loss and damage fund can be launched in Dubai with first pledges too. Because if we don't cut greenhouse gas emissions, no amount of money will be able to pay for damages done. This, in a nutshell, if you will, is the European Union's aim for COP28. And I'm going to Dubai, I'm going to the COP on behalf of the whole of the European Union with a clear mandate to build momentum for climate ambition, for climate action, and implementation across all aspects of the climate agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, in addition to implementing climate pledges, the world also needs to find ways to finance the green transition. The reality is that we're facing the, 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 the huge impact of it is such that no single institution no single set of countries, no single set of companies, or even all the public money that we can muster would be sufficient to address what is needed in terms of climate action. It's simple mathematics. To tackle climate change, actually, we need to mobilize trillions rather than billions and adopt a change mindset. That would also imply reforming the global financial system and to mobilize not only public but also private money to complement to public funding. And we have to make sure that all who have the ability to contribute actually do contribute. Businesses, sectors, non-traditional actors. After all, haven't they also played a role in contributing to climate change? And would it therefore not be fair that they also contribute to the solution? I honestly do think so. But to get funding at the scale that is needed, we also need to explore more unorthodox solutions. I've said it before, but I would gladly, I gladly repeat it here at your beautiful university. Aviation is an avenue of uh, specific interest because it is one of the things that is undertaxed all across the globe. If many of us either here or in Europe or in any other corner of the world, is filling up a car at a gas station, you would often pay a substantial amount in taxes. Some countries in the European Union, that amount of taxes would actually be 50 to 60 percent of the total sum you're paying. But when you would then move to a plane and, and fuel up a jumbo jet, you would be paying zero, absolutely zero in, in kerosene taxes. And that is actually off balance. So what I would want to explore is an international kerosene tax, a maritime levy, a fossil fuel tax, even a share of ETS proceeds. No, no stone. No stone should be left untouched to make sure we do get the money that is needed to tackle this global challenge. Then on the energy sector. The energy sector is one of the largest uh, contributors to global emissions. But it is also a sector where clean solutions do exist. And they are te technologi technologically mature and affordable. And so therefore, together with the COP28 president, the EU is building coalitions in support of fast-tracking the energy transition. We are proposing to set out global pledges on renewable energy on energy efficiency that would consist of the following. For renewables, we must triple the installed capacity to reach the amount that, we're, that we seek for. And by the way, I, have to, I, can, I can only commend Kenya for doing such an amazing job in um, its uh, renewables energy uh, percentage. 
For energy efficiency, we must double the global rate of energy efficiency improvements already in this decade. Your president, President Ruto, is championing this agenda too, and I thank him wholeheartedly for his support in this effort. Because global initiatives can actually make a difference in our climate action. What is more, these targets are ambitious, but they are actually achievable. And let me give you some numbers. Last year, sales of heat pumps increased by 10% across the world and 40% in the European Union alone. More generally speaking, 2022 truly was a record year for renewables. Global renewable energy capacity went up by an unprecedented 13%. And the world has also made strides in energy efficiency. In the EU alone, we made efficiency gains of 8%. And that might sound small, but you know how statistics work. If you think about what this means in one year, you see how tremendously substantial that is. And in Africa itself, Africa has huge potential in the green energy transition. Whether it is possibilities to develop renewables and green hydrogen, access to critical raw materials, or the availability of a young and skilled workforce. And that is a solid basis to grow and gain a global, a truly global competitive advantage. And Kenya itself, as I said, is already a front runner on renewable energy. You are generating enormous amounts, truly impressively enormous amounts of electricity through renewables energy with a target to reach 100% of electricity in 2030. That is, that truly is a remarkable record and shows that the African continent offers many solutions in the climate crisis. But to help these benefits come to, to fruition, we need the right levels of investment, a robust policy reform, and policy reform framework, and we need technology. And the EU is a committed partner for Africa's green industrialization. Together we have the know-how and industrial capacity to help scale up renewable capacity across your continent. The EU is the second largest market for renewables with specific strengths and the manufacturing of electrolyzers. And European, European industry is also leading in geothermal and hydropower technologies for which there is truly great potential here in Africa. Finally, the EU can also offer digital solutions for grids and technologies for manufacturing solar PVs. In Kenya, the EU's Global Gateway Programme already focuses on public, but also on private investments in both the green and digital transformations. We're investing over 3.47 billion, and that is more than 530 billion Kenyan shilling in 120, 120 green projects and around 430 million, which is the equivalent to over 67 billion, uh, billion Kenyan shilling on the digital transition. And the existing cooperation between the EU and Kenya is a truly shining example of how our partnership can work in practice. And we are eager to sign and operationalize the economic partnership agreement by the end of this year. Dear students, before I wrap up, allow me to add just a few lines on your own particular situation amidst, amidst all of this. We would truly be nowhere without you. Without youth, without young people asking, demanding us to take action. There's a scholar and writer that I used to read a lot about, Robert Van Gulik, and he has one of his main characters say at some point in time, there is no substitute for youth. And just recently, a European climate activist said that the best action you can take against climate change is to get organized. And I would like to underline that. The decisions that governments make this decade are crucial for all of our future, but particularly for your future. The difference between 1.5 and 3 degree temperatures increase sounds small, but it is actually impressive, and it will determine a lot in the lifetime that you have ahead of you. 
The European Green Deal itself was a response to a call for action from millions of young Europeans. And young people are also major innovators in climate change and they hold answers to many of our most pressing issues. We've seen this through the immense engagement at the recent Africa Climate Summit and especially during its youth assembly. And I'm truly happy that we support the participation of 24 youth delegates from our youth sounding boards across Africa to attend this summit. So I would like to encourage you to keep pushing for action, help politicians, help decision makers find solutions that work for all of our society. It won't always work, but remember, failing and falling is actually part of life. When you fall, you get up and you move forward. You try again. And that is relevant not only at a very personal scale, but also at a global scale. And coming from such a young continent, the voice of African youth is crucial on action, and particularly on international climate action. Yes, the bar for COP28 is high, and rightly so, because this is what the next generation expects of all of us. Thank you very much. Can we give him another round of applause, please? Thank you very much. So that's you actually might, very, that's you, actually very kind of you, that, that, when, that, that you, you, you ask for even more applause. Thank I know. <laughs> so we are going to go into a Q&A session, and I will ask uh, Mr. Orindi, uh, who is our Corporate Affairs uh, Director, to come and moderate. Uh, but we want to thank you most sincerely for painting the inequities that are there between the North and the South, between the developed countries and the developing countries. We want to thank you for being bold to say that uh, there are countries, I was actually thinking that maybe there should be a policy that would force them to pay for the sins that they have committed uh, in terms of climate change, but maybe that's a discussion that can happen. But down here in Kenya, you know, we are seeing El Nino now. Uh, is there a commitment by the EU to support us so that we don't perish? and deal with climate action going forward? Is there something that you are promising for the University of Nairobi, for the Institute of Climate Change and Adaptation, for Wangare Madai Institute, for our students, that we can do research that can actually drive policy? You don't have to answer, but over to Mr. Orinde. I thank you then. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Margaret Tatisson. Uh, Your Excellency, thank you very much for the wonderful lecture and the challenge you have given to the youth to make their voices heard in this important issue of climate change. So it's over to you, the youth, now to ask one or two questions. We are not going to ask many questions. Just want to, the first ones to go. Please raise your hands. I'm here. Yes, that gentleman over there, please give him a mic. He's going first. Then I'll come here. Uh, then I'll come here, then this gentleman with the specs. Okay? You, you, and then the, here we're going to have. Uh, okay, you are first, eh? All right, thank you. Right. Go first. Give him the mic. Oh, the mic is there. Okay, please. Yeah, sure. Uh, our dis uh, distinguished speaker, Mr. Walker. Uh, thanks a lot for that wonderful uh, lecture. I've been following you, including when you are addressing the European Union. And uh, I have uh, a question that will be followed by one of my colleagues. Now, European Union is this, Kenya's second largest trading partner, especially for vegetables, fruits, and also flowers and other trading commodities. Now, when it comes to this year, I've seen European Union has been very active in various initiatives and legislation regarding climate change. And in particular, we have the EU Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. We also have the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directives. I mean, there have been so much, and uh, I think uh, 
you, you've been driving the, the effort towards the, dealing with the climate change. Now, my first question, because we live in these sides of the, of the, of the world, Africa, what will be the social and economic impacts of all these uh, registrations regarding our access to the European market, paying to attention the issue of uh, carbon emissions, scope one, scope two, scope three, which are becoming now, it's like mandatory. What will be the effect on uh, us accessing the European market on these commodities? Thank you. Well, well, well thank you. Thank you very much, uh, sir. And um, if, if I would um, give you an answer, if, if I would have to give you an answer on uh, the whole range of uh, activities that you were mentioning, indeed, uh, us from both sides investing much more in our economic cooperation, in our trade cooperation, in making the most of uh, fighting uh, climate change uh, through the lens of adaptation, but also through the lens of mitigation. I am convinced, I am absolutely convinced that that would lead to substantially more economic growth. And the, the, the good news here is that on both sides, we see that there is a tremendously precious and, and, and fruitful partnership to be had in, in the decades ahead of us. Uh, if only we work together even more. And yes, you were mentioning a, a number of, of examples. I had the, uh, the privilege to be with a couple of uh, business people, a couple of the business people here during my previous visit. And they were amazed by not only the opportunities that are currently here, but also the opportunities that the future beholds. Specifically towards CBAM, I think that is actually one of these mechanisms that, yeah, it might seem as if it is an additional uh, burden. I think the reality will be that the direct impact on Kenya will be absolutely minimal and that actually it will help to have countries across the globe moving to a carbon market which in a slightly different form than the European Union, the Kenyan government is already working uh, towards. The same is true for many countries in Latin America and in Asia. And by the way, in California, in Quebec, uh, in China, uh, in the near future also in Brazil and Chile and in the European Union, we already have a, a carbon market. And this is a way forward to actually deal in a fair way with emissions. Um, you actually see that the polluter pays, that is, that is the principle in the European Union. And uh, my best guess is that if we do this well, it will have a great effect in terms of climate action, and yet at the same time, we will manage to even further enhance uh, the, uh, the fundamental potential that is there in, in economic terms. Yes, our, our trade numbers are looking great, but frankly speaking, I think there is much more to be had, and it will be to the benefit, benefit of all our countries. Because in the end, trade is much more than a transaction. It is a way to, to build even stronger bilateral ties, and we are about to do it. Next. All protocols observed. Good morning, everybody. My name is Boaz Ogada, and I'm a student leader at the Departmental Climate Group, which is hosted at the Institute for Climate Change Adaptation. So my question is on transformations in the realm of development. So as humanity continues to grapple with the triple crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, and pollution, there is a growing momentum within sustainability discussion on the critical topic of just transition. And for the sake of our audience, just transition simply means equitable and in inclusivity of marginalized groups, such as the youths and, and indigenous communities. And the science tells us as that these are the groups who have the greatest potential to achieve transformations. So my question is, as the EU Commission, what are some of the initiatives that you are spearheading to realize just transition, and how can the youth be meaningfully engaged in such initiatives? Thank you. Now, I think that's an excellent question, and that is actually at the heart of this matter. We are, as a world population, we are, um, uh, at the early stages of a very, very significant transition. 
And this transition will only succeed if we make into it into a just transition. Because the vast majority of the people across the globe do see that we need to move to a different operating model in terms of emissions, in terms of the economy, in terms of uh, fighting climate change. But many people, not only here in, in beautiful Kenya, but across Africa, but also, frankly speaking, across the European Union, do worry what that would mean for, for their own lives, how it might actually affect their jobs, how it might affect their wallets, how it will affect the future of their children, and rightly so. So the transition will only succeed if we do make it just, and we make sure that the, this, this vast group, we call the middle classes, but also those who are the most vulnerable, if we take them by the hand, if we give them the opportunity to also reach a better future. And that actually involves a, a combination of things. I was already mentioning the, the 3.5 billion. Uh, I was already mentioning the uh, aviation tax, which is of course, you know, way out in the future. But frankly speaking, there is, it is a deliberate choice because there is a fairness element to it. Because, you know, who are the people who are flying the most? those in the most affluent uh, countries. The world sees approximately 100,000 flights a day. And out of that 100,000, I think approximately 30,000 take place in the European Union. And I don't know the exact number, but probably a roughly similar uh, number is true for the United States. And if we would tax flights or cares in use, it is it's pretty clear who is gonna pay uh, the biggest part of the bill. And that's only fair, right? Uh, next to that, I think, um, it is also good to continue with two things. One is everything that is linked to development aid, and there actually, if you look at the number, not only of the European Union as an institution, but if you add up uh, the various streams of the 27 countries of the European Union, you arrive at a very substantial level. The same is true for uh, the economy and, and, and trade relationships. We often look at individual countries, but if you dare again, if you add up uh, the partnership between Africa and, by the way, also Kenya specifically, and the European Union, you arrive at very, very impressive numbers. Whether you look at technology, whether you look at agriculture, um, uh, whether you look at more classic forms of trade, uh, but more is to be had. And it is that whole combination, and I'm deliberately mentioning economic growth, because economic growth, sustainable economic growth, is in the end the best way to combine fighting climate change and making sure people have a, uh, have a fruitful future. Thank you. Thank you. Now we take a lady. Let's take a lady so that, uh, yeah, let's take a lady. Okay, thank you. I'll ask the next question for gender balance. Good morning. Not only for, uh, for, for gender balance, I hope. <laughs> um, thank you, EU Commissioner, uh, Mr. Wokpe. That was a very insightful speech. My name is Florence Gatome, and I'm a PhD student in climate change and adaptation. I have a follow-up question to the first question, and my question is, are there plans to build capacity locally along the value and supply chains for our important export commodities in support of the EU-Kenya Economic Partnership Agreement that was recently negotiated in June? Thank you. Thank you, and an and, 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 and excellent question. Um, I think the honest answer is yes, yes there is, but there's much more that we actually should be doing together. Um, yesterday I was uh, with um, uh, your, your, your climate minister and we were also discussing you know, how to continue and, and further enhance our collaboration on the example I just gave of, of aviation tax and how to potentially pull that off with a coalition of the willing. We were discussing how to compare notes and learn from Kenya's ideas of a a trade market or an, an a carbon market, I should say, and the ETS system that we now have for roughly 10 years in the European Union. To compare notes on uh, climate adaptation. And I was yesterday, I was at, at ICPAC, and I was amazed by uh, the research that's being done and how that is being used to, to make sure people are kept out of, of, of harm's way when either flooding or droughts or any other um, uh, adverse climate effect is actually uh, getting into place. So there's much more from just the climate angle to be done. But the same is true from, from a business angle. And, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, referring to, to the last question as well. If I listen to business leaders, which I did last time when I was in Kenya, 
if I listen to the EU ambassadors, which I did both last time but also yesterday, uh, and to many people from, from, from civil society, there is a clear desire to make more of this truly incredibly important bond. That is the desire of the European Union. The desire of the European Union truly is to further enhance our partnership, um, to make sure it stretches into all the domains, my portfolio, but also the economic, economic portfolio, the um, safety and security uh, portfolio, where clearly Kenya is doing a fantastic role in the region. And I think the best testimony to that friendship and that commitment from the European side is if you would look into how many uh, government leaders, uh, ministers of foreign affairs, and other leaders from the various member states, but also from the European Union, have been here in, in the last one and a half years. It is a testimony, I would hope, to our commitment and our strong desire for partnership. Thank you, and um, uh, dear friends, thank you very much for allowing me the opportunity. It's uh, fantastic to be here. I wish all the faculty all the best, but in particular also all the students a very, very fruitful career, not only at this university, but also on all else that lies on the other side of being at university. Thank you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Okay, uh, I've been asked to, to invite uh, the Dean Faculty of Science and Technology, uh, Professor Lemni Dakerubo, uh, to move a vote of thanks. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Warindi. So now mine is very simple, just to, may I take uh, this uh, very rare opportunity to thank our chief guest uh, of the European Union Commissioner in charge of climate action, that is uh, Hopke Westira, I've read it in Kiswahili. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, so thank you very much for a very interesting lecture, very interesting and excellent presentation that has elicited a lot of questions. And I know most of the students and staff ha had a lot of questions to ask, but because of time, they had to limit the number of questions to ask. But I just wanted to know if it is possible to continue this ex uh, conversation after this. And uh, we have opportunity, a lot of space, where you can come and join the faculty, just like uh, the distinguished chair, that is uh, uh, Patrick Bakoyen. We continue, we continuously interact with him, and uh, he has really helped us, uh, especially the two institutes, that's Wangari Madai Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies and the Institute of Climate Change and Adaptation. We've grown through his leadership so we just want to request if it is possible to also have you as part of the faculty. Uh, I don't know in whichever way that you can be engaged. Um, thank you very much. Um, and also all the guests that you came with, the team members, I want to also thank you very much for coming. May I also take this opportunity to thank our vice chancellor, that is uh, Professor Stephen Kiama for sparing his time off his busy, very busy schedule to attend this important meeting. And also to choose the Faculty of Science and Technology uh, to host this important uh, strategic lecture. And I also want to say that the Vice Chancellor has also been supporting this uh, faculty throughout in issues of climate change 
through the Institute of Climate Change and Adaptation and also through Wangarimadai Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies. So let's clap for him. May I also take this opportunity to thank the Vice Chancellor Research, Innovation and Enterprise, Professor Margaret Hutchinson, for facilitating this important meeting and warmly. You saw she was doing it very well, so she facilitated it very warmly. And also for supporting this faculty throughout in the issues of innovations, enterprise, and also research, and also uh, especially in climate uh, change matters. Let's clap for him. For her, for her, sorry. May I take also this, uh, uh, this particular opportunity to thank the Chief Operations Officer for leading the team that organized this important uh, meeting. Let's uh, clap for him. Let me for not forget to thank the Acting uh, Dean, uh, Professor Andrew Kahonge, who is here who has been working tirelessly behind the scenes to ensure that this particular function is uh, successful. In our midst, we also have the director, Wangarimba, sorry, the chairman of departments of this faculty and the director, Wangarimadai Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies, who has also been working very closely with uh, uh, the distinguished chair of Wangarimadai Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies, that is, uh, uh, Professor Dr. Uh, Patrick Vakoyan in issues of in, uh, climate change and also uh, in, in envir uh, sorry, uh, climate change and adaptation. So let's thank the chairs of department and also the director of Wangarimadai Institute for Peace and Environmental Studies. I, may I take this also opportunity to thank the director of corporate affairs for putting all, all the facilities in place and protocols for this important or high level meeting. He says it's high level, so meetings are categorized differently, but he made sure this uh, meeting is organized in a very appropriate way. Let's thank him. I, want, I can also see a lot of the staff from the Faculty of Science and Technology and also students. I want to thank you very, very uh, much for making sure you don't let the fact the dean uh, down. You've made sure you've come and supported this important occasion. So let's clap for you. I want to also thank the catering uh, services, Riziki, for making sure our guests are fed, are, are fed very well. Let's clap. And finally, may I uh, thank the caretaker for spearheading the tree planting exercise that is going to take place after this particular occasion. Thank you very much. Can we clap for the Dean, Faculty of Science and Technology, <laughs> Professor Leonida Kerubo, for hosting us and uh, for uh, giving that vote of thanks, Asante Sana. Uh, we I think we have come to the sad end of a great lecture, but I think the conversation, as she said, should go on. And uh, I think our EU commissioner has been given a challenge to be part and parcel of this university. And I could see that he was blushing in agreement. So we are so thankful. And also the other delegation members. So we are going to have a photo session uh, and then, where is Stalin Kibet? Dr. Kibet, where are you? Ah, he's waiting at the site. Because ladies and gentlemen, now the real action has started. You know, we got a, a lecture on climate action. Now action where our EU commissioner is going to grow a tree. He will start by planting, but he has promised he will be coming often to water it. And so we are going to have that tree planting ceremony uh, to mark this uh, great lecture. And then we'll have a media interview. And uh, so, uh, Mr. Orindi, I know you ambushed me at 6.30 in the morning. So uh, you have said about a selfie. What does that mean? I guess you have the other mic. Can you thank tell you. us? Uh, thank you very much. Just to invite uh, Vice Chancellor Management to come in front and the EU delegation so that we take the 
oh, we photograph here. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. And also, the people ask the questions. You earn yourself a privilege to take a photo with the commissioner. Yeah, the three students. Three can you come up? Three people ask the questions. And we can also have the student leaders, the campus leaders, governor and uh, deputy governor secretary to come also to uh, take a photo with the guest. Thank you. Members of the EU delegation, please come.